All right. So I got a joke for you. What do you get when you cross a pandemic inspired lockdown with a company that suddenly needs a virtual workforce? You get a new opportunity to rethink your organizational structure and a new opportunity for business process outsourcing. I am your host, Jim Genia. I am the editor at Bold Business. Uh, what is Bold Business? Bold Business is a global tech and media company with a substantial business process outsourcing footprint. Bold leverages 25 years of executive experience and Bold has a track record of success in such industries as healthcare, telecom, tech, and more. And of course, Bold offers a wide range of BPO solutions. Joining me today uh, is CEO Ed Kopko. Ed has a wealth of business process outsourcing experience, driving cost-effective global business models. Also joining me is James Hummer, Senior Vice President at Bold Business. James has a proven track record of success maximizing organizational impact by designing and implementing mission critical programs. And also joining is Melvin Clamata, Director of Business Excellence at Bold Business. Uh, through business transformation initiatives, Melvin has helped clients save over $20 million. So why have this webinar? Why now? Well, 2020 has been an interesting year to say the least, and businesses large and small, like Facebook, Microsoft, Square, Twitter, They've all had to pivot to a virtual workforce. So, Ed, tell me, what does all this mean? Well, Jim, thanks for, for that. Um, so COVID-19 has really created an opportunity for companies uh, to rethink how they're organizing themselves. We kind of have had in an emergency way been forced to push a lot of our employees outside of offices. We've moved from a office and centric environment to a going to a distributed workforce where they're working from home or other places. And the combination of that has created some very unique opportunities where there will be some significant winners as a result of, of this development. Okay. So it seems like we're in a remote first model. Do you believe this is a temporary fix or a permanent change? Well, um, as I uh, just recently published a piece called The Come to Me Economy, I believe that the evolution of a virtual workforce is a immutable force to reckon with. It is going to continue because we as human beings want things to be easier. We bring heat into our houses, entertainment into our houses, and now we're moving to a next paradigm, which is called bring more work to our houses so we don't have to travel as much and do everything else. Okay. Um, so this is forcing companies to rethink the concept of geography and, and boundaries on, on their work? Yeah, well, if you think about it, Jim, what what happened, and I've talked to a number of CEOs over the last uh, few months who shared similar stories. The, when COVID hit, uh, many of them were not that prepared to go to a remote only environment. Uh, but what they did was they pushed their employees to go home, you know, and said, "Work, work from your homes." And the first iteration of this was to say they, we are not in one location as I use the word office centric which I don't take credit for uh, the CEO for Shopify recently was quoted with that but um, we're not going to be an office centric environment as much as more of a remote workforce and once that cat is out of the bag things can start to get interesting Okay. We, you and I in a previous uh, webinar talked about the mess strategy. Do you want to touch on that just a little bit? Yeah, sure. So um, what the logical ne next processes are for companies, and we're hearing about this, you know, so, you know, I've got a, a long Manhattan connection and I'm hearing about people who worked in, you know, offices in Manhattan. They're not just moving outside to, um, uh, the suburbs, in some cases, they're making the decisions to move to very different parts of the world because their companies have now accepted the fact that they don't need to be in a 
office centric environment, they can be anywhere. So this chart that we have up uh, is kind of uh, implies a uh, a plan where you can use your own resources as well as partner resources to take advantage of a worldwide uh, uh, environment. And the mesh is more about saying, I de-risk my company from the office centric environment where if we do have a COVID and it goes through my office, my business collapses. Okay. Um, so it seems like more companies are going virtual. Uh, can you talk about the need for a partner when these companies shift to digital? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so um, you know, we have a long history. Uh, cor corporate America, corporate world uses suppliers all the time. Uh, there isn't a company that really exists that doesn't outsource some components of what they do. Um, what a what partnering uh, has traditionally done is said, I, I, I have somebody make a part for my car or truck because they can make it more efficiently than me. They can make my speakers for my car because I can make it more efficient than Ford Motor can, you know, et cetera. So there's a variety of processes that in many cases uh, a partner can do better or they have a approach to, to bringing other types of uh, productivity to an, uh, a client, such as geographic dis uh, uh, diversity and uh, uh, global diversity that enables them to get just amazing results that they cannot as easily do for themselves. Okay. Uh, I'd like to pause for a moment and let the audience know that if you have any questions about anything, there's a chat function in Zoho. Uh, it's the Q&A button. Uh, put those questions in the chat and send them to me, and we will go over them if there's time at the end. Um, okay, so James, we've mentioned smart operational excellence. Can you, can you describe smart operational excellence, excellence, what it is? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jim. Um, so, you know, what is smart operational excellence? Um, this is bold businesses framework for systematically evaluating and improving operational processes. Uh, we use this both internally and with our clients. We're looking to optimize their business processes, either for internal use or for preparation for outsourcing to a BPO. Um, and, you know, pretty much this is applicable to all companies. Um, if you're in healthcare, you're billing clients and tracking that bill all the way through payments. If you're a retail organization, you're shipping products, following up with customers, making sure that that customer service is, is going excellently well. If you're a sales organization, you're tracking leads to close deals. So every component of a business has some amount of uh, workflow or process optimization that should be tracked. And additionally, this is more relevant now that everyone's gone virtual. Um, you know, four or five months ago, you, we had an, we, most of us worked in an office together, so we had tribal knowledge. Uh, we could kind of walk across the hall, tap someone on the shoulder and say, hey, how does this work? Um, now that we're all dispersed and we're all working from home, uh, lack of documentation and lack of metrics are really impacting businesses um, and forcing them to take a hard look and to understand how effective are their business units working. And so this is a great opportunity to kind of look hard at these uh, different workflows and optimize them for this new virtual reality. So when we're talking about smart operational uh, excellence, um, we're talking about basically three key metrics. We're looking to increase the speed of a, a process or a, a workflow. We're looking to increase the quality of the output of that workflow. And we're also looking to decrease the cost in order to run that operation. And so let's, let's double click into each of these metrics real quick. So first, when we're talking about speed, we're talking about two things here. One, we're, we're talking about how long it takes uh, a piece of work to go from A to Z. So the, the length of time it takes for the process to be completed for each um, you know, discrete packet of work. The second thing that we're looking at is the speed at which each uh, at each value add step. 
Um, what we're looking for there is trying to identify bottlenecks where work is being compacted or jammed and impacting the overall speed from A to C. So when we're talking about speed, those are the two things that we want to think about and optimizing for. Second, quality. Um, it's kind of a no-brainer to say if you're going to have a high-quality output or a high-quality product, your customers are going to have you know, a, a strong and positive reaction to that. Uh, low quality is going to have the inverse. People are not going to be super pleased if you have low quality output or product. Um, the other kind of additional negative to low quality is you generally have to go fix the things that you've screwed up. Um, so you have to not only spend time making an imperfect uh, output, but you also have to spend additional time solving that and fixing that output. So, you know, increasing your high your quality output is a tremendous way to gain an advantage in everything you're doing. And then finally, cost. Um, you generally, you can uh, increase uh, or decrease your cost by increasing the speed at which you're doing something and increasing the quality and decreasing the amount of um, uh, rework that you're having to do. But uh, as we'll explore a little bit later, you also have some levers and cost when you're talking about where's the work and who's operating the, the, the actual operation. And so we'll, we'll cover that a little bit later. Uh, James, I'd like to take a moment to say that you have a white paper that will be made available pretty soon right oh, on this yeah. very topic. Thanks, Jim. I, I forgot about that. Thank you for catching me on that one. Yeah. Um, so you've mentioned uh, business process. Can you go into a little more detail about the components of a good business process? Yeah, absolutely. So um, – we think that there are basically four components of an excellent process. Uh, these are kind of like a Maslow's hierarchy that they, they're stackable. So you can't really jump to the fourth stage without making sure that you get one through three um, nailed down. So these are replicable, measurable, scalable, and then finally intelligent or prescriptive. And so, you know, just like we did before, let's kind of zoom into each one of these, kind of talk about why they're important and what they do. So replicable is, is really your table stakes. It's your foundation. Um, we want to make sure that when we are um, running a process, we know what we're going to get out of it. So when we, we put in X, we're going to get Y out. If we're putting in X and we're A, B, or C, or some other variable is coming out, that means that the process is broken. Um, the, the quality is low, and we're not getting the, the desired outcome that we want on a repeatable basis. Um, at that point, we need to go back and make sure that, one, everyone knows what they should be doing, and two, that this is documented and in, uh, in the process is, is fundamentally there. So once we've identified and built that repeatable process, we then want to start adding some measurements to it. Um, usually when we're talking about measurements, the simplest ones are usually the best to start with. How, how long does it take for that measurement or how long does that uh, process take to do? And what is the percentage of quality uh, or rework that has to be done for each piece of work that gets done? Those are going to tell you if that repeatable process is working you know, well and gives you a good sense of the health of the system. The, the third piece is scalability. Now, generally, when people are talking about scalability, we're thinking about scaling up. Um, but you know, in most things in life, things don't always go up. Sometimes you have to react to something, you have to scale up quickly, and, and then that workflow goes away or, or kind of slows down a little bit, so you need to scale down. And scalability is important because not only do you need to be able to flex up in times of, uh, of need, but when the, the things slow down, you need to either redeploy resources or scale those processes back down in an effective way without disrupting the rest of your business. That's where partnerships and you know, um, outsourcing become you know, really strong tools to managing the variability in work. And then finally, once we have one through three kind of nailed down, we want to build an intelligence layer on top of this. And what we mean by that is uh, you want to have a system that's going to tell you when something's going to break. Um, you know, for example, if you have a team of 10 people that are doing a data enrichment process, um, and you have a couple of people out sick, you want to be able to look and, and have that process tell you, we know how much work is going to be coming in. We know how much these individuals are contributing to this process. 
If we have a couple of individuals sick, we need to either, you know, understand where we might miss in terms of SLAs or, or some sort of measurements. And then we need to be able to backfill or figure out how to resolve that before the system breaks. And so an intelligent or prescriptive process is going to be able to kind of build a safety net around the entire thing so that we are proactively reviewing the system and ensuring its good health before anything goes wrong. Got it. Melvin, we've talked about uh, how SmartOpX is used to make businesses better. Can you walk us through the framework of SmartOpX? Sure, thanks, Jim. So let's talk more about Smart Plus Operational Excellence. So basically, this is an iterative framework wherein each step is part of a continuous cycle. The goal here is to go through each of the steps of the process and consistently improve, building and creating synergies in operations to meet business goals and objectives. So the first part here is the define phase. Um, this is the part where during the solutioning stage, we employ methodologies and techniques to capture customer goals and requirements. So we partner with clients to understand the speed, quality, and cost to deliver products and services. So in this stage, we also define what will be the key performance indicators or KPIs. So as an example, um, in a back office work or an order entry type of process, um, a good measure for speed could be the time to complete one order entry transaction. Like if, if uh, an agent copies and pays or needs to fill out or research and information about the customer, customer information and then has to go through a different database just to fill out those information, how fast can that be completed? That transaction can be finished. Next is quality. Um, it pertains about the accuracy of work, the, the correctness of data gathered. And then lastly, cost. Um, how many transactions can be completed in a, in a day? So those things will be defined during the defined phase. Um, in the standardized phase, we employ techniques to build process flow and capture the steps. Um, this includes inputs and outputs of the process. So the goal here is to capture the as-is process and then identify the most efficient and effective route to convert inputs to outputs and make it as a standard of operation. So here we, we build process maps, we create flowcharts. Moving on to design phase, we assemble an efficient production operation. So here, um, in this particular stage, it starts with an inventory of the existing resources and then laying out how a production operation would look like. So in this stage, uh, we already have most likely an idea of the flow of operation and how resources we will be utilized. So coming from the standardized phase, we're simply refining the flowchart diagrams in an operation view wherein production is being laid out. And then the fourth stage, which is, the, which is the manage phase. So at this stage, we further improve our production design by matching demand and supply. So what is the order quantity of products and services that needs, um, and what are the resources of operation uh, at operations disposal to produce? So, um, so the goal uh, in this particular stage is to identify the optimal utilization of resources. Here, uh, we determine the actual lead times the best inventory method to use, uh, how much is the volume of orders, and then out of those information, build the capacity plan to manage performance and cost. Um, the fifth phase is the track phase. Um, so basically here we ensure we have a system to track performance and a practical system which is working to review the trends of the performance in operation. Um, I'd say a good system is the one that visually shows you real-time or near real-time performance and alerts for potential failure. So just before a failure happens, we have enough time for mitigation actions. And if performance is good, then of course, we can maintain and consistently deliver. And of course, tell the team, okay, guys, good job. Uh, just continue what you're doing. So the same good trend will happen. Improve phase is where all actions converge on how to improve every process. So this is where scientific and methodological process analysis, problem solving methods, root cause analysis happens in aid to generate insights or deep understanding about the operations, performance, and also including the internal and external factors affecting the output. And finally, 
review and refine. This is the phase where there is emphasis on evaluating performance against the business objectives, uh, which is defined um, on the first phase, which is the defined phase. Um, here, uh, we identify what truly matters and eliminate unnecessary non-value adding utilization of resources. Um, in the BPO world, one of the major focus is to drive the bottom line and bold business smart plus operational excellence. Um, it's it, the framework stresses attention to resource optimization. Considering that the framework is continuous and iterative in nature, it's like building a culture of excellence. And the application of operational excellence will enable operations to continue to improve. So basically, that's it, Jim. <laughs> Thanks, Melvin. Uh, James, I have a feeling those yellow boxes on that flowchart are important. What, what do they mean? James, are you still there? Melvin, do you want to tell us what those flow uh, those Hey, sorry about that. I, I was on mute. All right. <laughs> Apologize for that. Um, Melvin, thank you for that awesome uh, overview of the framework. Um, so as, as Melvin mentioned, this is an iterative process. So every time we're going through it, we're, we're trying to make incremental steps to improving the savings or the speed, the quality, cost um, of that process or workflow. Now, those yellow boxes that, uh, Jim, you just mentioned, those are opportunities and points within the, the framework where we want to kind of think about um, who is actually operating the process and where are those individuals located. Now, there, there's a couple of different ways to think about that. One is, you know, internal, your company is running this process internally. That means you probably have a W-2 employee that's running it. Now, as we're starting to virtualize uh, uh, offices, you may think about moving a, a customer service um, uh, uh, group to a lower cost part of the country. So if you're a Manhattan based company, maybe you put um, your customer service in Iowa and you enjoy some cost savings by, you know, uh, saving in office space in, in, in labor wages. But, you know, taking that a step further in globalization, you may also start thinking about outsourcing to lower cost countries where you can have this, what we call labor cost arbitrage where you are moving a process that has now been defined and streamlined from a high cost um, owned resource to a lower cost outsource resource. And when you outsource, you, you can start thinking about different um, points of savings. Um, not only do you, you know, potentially enjoy some cost savings by going to a lower cost part of the, the globe, but if you're removing someone from a salary to uh, an outsource role, you're saving on, um, benefits, healthcare benefits, your office space, your technology, insurances, uh, a number of other different items, which you can probably book at, at an employee from 20 to about 25% on top of their hourly or salary wage. So, you know, those are the points, those yellow boxes are when you want to think, hey, am, am I, is this company, you know, is the process going well? And are the operators the, the best cost operators that we have? And do we have additional levers to, uh, uh, find some cost savings within the system. Got it. Uh, Ed, I feel like I have a good understanding of Smart Plus operational excellence. Can you talk a little about how Bold uses it to help other companies? Yeah, sh sure. Thanks, uh, uh, both Melvin and James. Thank you for, for that. Um, so at Bold, we, we kind of offer a la carte, an, an a la carte approach. We can start from just helping you with some process consulting. Uh, as Melvin went through the art of actually understanding your processes and the metrics and how they're performing and how speed is and quality and effective cost per unit is a complicated one. And we find many times clients just don't have a good handle on some of those costs. And they're a little more complicated than they appreciate when, when we start to do our analysis. So we offer services in what we call the strategy and enablers category, which allows you to take a look at uh, and have us help you rethink some of these processes uh, and uh, enable you if, you if you decide to kind of be able to do it yourself. We will help you through that process and give you uh, uh, 
various kinds of support in terms of developing those metrics, those systems. Uh, training in particular becomes a very big lever uh, to consider that many companies don't always uh, fully operate. Um, the other couple char charts or segments here are we, we cut across a number of different kinds of categories of services that we can do, you know, for, com for companies and we do do for companies. So any of these in this category are uh, examples of typical uh, processes that companies can find significant uh, savings. And when I say savings, the chart did not uh, discuss this, but savings typically can, can uh, be 40 to 70% uh, based on, depending on how the clients uh, are situated or how your process are situated in the uh, beginning. And I want to emphasize those numbers because we consistently see that, um, that there can be significant cut in costs while not, not just not sacrificing quality, but improving quality through a rigorous training and metric driven system that, that manages, as Melvin said, for continuous and, you know, continuous improvement. Okay. Okay. Um, um, people, people listening now, I mean, people that, uh, uh, listen to this in the future, cause this is going to be posted on boldbusiness.com. I uh, might be looking for insight on choosing an outsourcing partner. Anything you want to give us? Is this for Ed? This is for Ed. This is for you. Yeah, I'll put the plug in. Of course, bold. You know, so um, so. But in terms of a perspective, um, I think one of the things that you you want to look at is uh, at expertise. Try to understand their process. Can they help you deliver a global footprint? Do they have experts who are truly um, uh, trained and experienced with understanding processes and can actually kind of roll up their sleeves and get get into the nitty gritty with you because process standardization is a very, very complex, uh, uh, can be very, very complex depending on the kinds of business or company that you are. Um, you know, as Jim mentioned in the uh, intro, we, we work in telecommunications, engineering, uh, healthcare, uh, and various technology support for clients. And these, these processes a lot of times are just not pretty and they're not very well documented. So if you're looking to try to get to that next level, um, this, these are some of the considerations. And if I could, Jim, for one last point here is that, um, uh, you know, as part of the, the introduction, I mentioned the fact that um, we're all going more virtual. This is a unique opportunity for every company in you're being faced uh, with the opportunity and also the mandate to say, how do I manage my company more efficiently through, you know, a going virtual process? Our suggestion strongly is to embrace a smart excellence model where you go to metrics driven. I can't tell you over the years, Jim, how many times I had, I've talked to CEOs about why do they have all their people in one office and their biggest fear was, I don't know how productive they will be. I'm afraid that I'm going to have a lot of waste that they're going to take advantage of me. Well, you know, we're going to have to get come to grips with that, that that is our world. And if you are good at understanding your processes and metrics, not only will you get the performance, you know, performance improvement, et cetera, you'll have a happier workforce and you'll have a better company overall. All right. Thanks, Ed. Uh, it's Q&A time. Uh, and so I have a couple questions here. Uh, this one is for James. James, where should a company start when they want to review their business process operations? Yeah, um, awesome. Thanks, Jim. Um, so place to start, obviously, you, you want to pick and figure out which, op, uh, which operation or which workflow you want to work on first. Um, generally, the, the ones you want to look at are the, the ones that you uh, perform the most often and have the, the most cost uh, associated with them. 
Uh, you can also say which ones drive the business uh, forward uh, most and which ones are, are critical. Once you identify that workflow or process that you are looking to optimize, um, there's a couple different ways to, to look at it. The one that we use at Bold is called top down. So what you wanna do is kind of figure out what are the big drivers of that workflow that you know really uh, impact it. So what are the inputs and what are the outputs? How do you define those very clearly? And then what are the steps that you need to go through in order to take those inputs and create a high quality output? So, you know, to, to, to boil it down, first you gotta figure out what are the key workflows that are, are really driving your business? And then two, reviewing those workflows, you wanna take a, a kind of the top down look, the high level look from what are our inputs, where do we wanna to get to, what are our outputs, and how, what are the big steps we gotta take in order to achieve that process? All right. Um, here's one for Melvin. Melvin, how do you define a good KPI? Right. Good question, Jim. Um, I'd say a good KPI should first align to the business outcomes, um, which is expected by the organization, uh, both the strategic and the financial objectives. So, for example, increase in revenue or customer satisfaction. So, with using our Smart Plus operational excellence, we define the three key metrics we would like to, you know, measure on. So for speed, it could be turnaround time. How fast can we serve our customers? Uh, it would be a transaction. How can how fast can we complete it? For quality, uh, it would be the quality of work or the accuracy of work. Um, could be also customer effort. Um, this is where some of our enablers would come in. Like for example, um, how fast can a customer complete a transaction if they do it themselves? What are the self-service um, features available to the customer. And then lastly, cost. Um, it could be productivity. Uh, how many transactions can an operations team complete in a day? Um, second, it should be measurable, meaning you can quantify it and there is a system in place to consider as a single source of truth about the KPI, uh, meaning um, the numbers are correct and numbers don't lie. Um, that's that's really uh, a tricky thing because you know numbers don't lie, but the manner how you process should be correctly you know measured or done. So that that for me that's a good KPI. Awesome, thank you, Melvin. Uh, looks like another question, Ed. How do you ensure quality when working with an outsourcing group? Well, that's uh, um. That's a very good question. It typically will start with the contracting because um, there's usually a process to go through and we recommend um, various stages to the contracting where we build a, uh, a relationship and understanding of the process, the goals of the company, and then set targets that your outsource partner um, uh, can can achieve. Um, and that, that is something that, you know, someone like, um, Mel, like Melvin and his group would, would be involved early on. And we usually, usually recommend that, that, that before committing to the whole process that we actually do, you know, in that strategy enabler category, we do that process review to try to identify what the opportunity is and how we might be able to assist the client. So just don't leap all the way through, but, you know, start in a phase two step process. Okay. Uh, that looks like all the questions we have. I want to thank uh, all of these uh, experts, Ed, James, and Melvin for joining us. And everyone that tuned in, this uh, webinar, the deck and the video will be made available to you. And it'll be a story up on boldbusiness.com later this week. Um, so thanks again for tuning in.